For years, politicians have searched for ways to go around the media to avoid the so-called gatekeepers in the parliamentary press gallery and elsewhere and present their message directly to voters. As we all know, John Howard used talkback radio with this in mind. But now the digital revolution has not only knocked down the gates, it's also provided a host of new ways for politicians to reach out to voters. Welcome to Media Watch. I'm Jonathan Holmes, and that was the Canberra Press Gallery's most respected veteran, the Nine Network's Laurie Oakes. As we saw last week in the coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings and their aftermath, the digital revolution has changed many things, including the coverage of fast-breaking news. But we're not going over that ground tonight. Instead, as the phony election campaign heats up, we look at an old competition, politicians versus reporters, in the new media age. More and more politicians are discovering the joys of blogging and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. And the political parties are waging their perennial war against each other and their adversaries in the media using new weapons. For example, in late March, the government got wind that the Daily Telegraph was about to publish this full-page feature. Julia's gift to Australia is massive and growing debt. The afternoon before, the ALP launched a preemptive strike on its Facebook page, though it was careful to target the opposition, not the telly. Don't let the Liberals continue their shameless scare campaign on Australia's modest debt levels. Click share to let your friends and family know the truth. And people did. Labor's bar chart showing that Australia's government debt to GDP ratio is one of the lowest in the world attracted more than 12,000 shares. As Laurie Oakes reported in his column a few days later, The ALP's digital team was able to determine it had been seen by 815,360 people in that time, a long way ahead of anything the party had posted previously. Since readership of The Telegraph is just over 780,000, Labor is claiming its own version of the debt story reached more people than the newspapers. That would certainly be a milestone. The Libs hit back on their Facebook page. Government net debt. It's the kind of battle we'll be seeing more and more of in coming months. Meanwhile, individual politicians have become stars of the social media world, especially, and way out in front, Kevin Rudd. He has 1.2 million Twitter followers. Today, my first double selfie. Hmm, which way to look, K. Rudd? Tens of thousands of fans on Facebook. Why aren't you PM, Kevin? We want you back. And a YouTube presence that varies from the silly and wildly popular to clips from his most solemn speeches. And I think it's important that we reflect for a moment uh, on the tragedy which has been experienced by our American brothers and sisters uh, in the last uh, 24 hours in Boston. Another digital warrior is opposition communications spokesman Malcolm Turnbull. Only Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard have more followers on Twitter. And as he told a conference on digital media last November, that gives him enormous reach. If I write a blog like I did yesterday complaining about, you know, the ABC's reporting of, uh, on the NBN, I can put that on my blog, post it on Twitter, and it is drawn to the attention of the possessors of 130-odd thousand devices. Now, that is that is vastly more than the readership, say, of the Financial Review. Indeed, in his blogs and his Twitter stream, Malcolm Turnbull doesn't just avoid the gatekeepers in the press gallery and the mainstream media more generally, he takes them on directly. Sydney Morning Herald gets it wrong, all over the front page. Close your eyes and don't think about the price, the ages idea of vision. And Mr Turnbull engages with his political foes too. Julia Gillard's office took to her Facebook page to attack his fibre-to-the-node broadband network. With Labour, connecting to high-speed fibre broadband is free. Under the Coalition, you'll pay up to $5,000 to connect. And Malcolm Turnbull fired right back. It is unlikely we will see this appear on Julia Gillard's Facebook page. It will be your kids who repay the $94 billion of NBN debt. Turnbull, the former journalist, revels in the fray. Politicians have never had less reason to complain about the media than today because we have a mega, megaphones of our own uh, and a capacity to respond and make our own case directly uh, of a like that, is, that previous generations of politicians didn't have. 
But a fellow panelist at that Walkley conference in Canberra, American journalist and author Charles Feldman, responded to that proposition with horror. When I hear, uh, Malcolm, with due respect, when I hear you say, you know, politicians never have had less of reason to complain, frankly, that scares me. And it, 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 it reminds me of the old Jaws trailer, be afraid, be very afraid. From his base in California, Charles Feldman explained to me why he's very afraid. The problem is that the politician's new weapon, the internet, is also depriving the mainstream media of its revenue and therefore of its manpower. In a, a world where there are now fewer checks and balances, and I'm talking about journalistic checks and balances, the danger is that the politician's voice is then not examined and cross-examined as it ought to be. Charles Feldman and Laurie Oakes are of one mind. The politicians are escaping media scrutiny. They can present material, including news material, in the way they want it presented, without pesky journalists getting in the way. And here's the most important thing, without having to answer questions. The further this goes, the less accountability we're going to have in the system. For Sydney University lecturer Peter Chen, the author of a recent book on Australian politics in the digital age, there's more than a touch of self-interest in Laurie Oakes's concern. The Canberra Press Gallery, Chen reckons, is not as indispensable as it thinks it is. What he's really identifying is that politicians are able to get around the channel that people like Laurie Oakes control and have always been the gatekeepers of. And clearly, if I was employed in that industry, I would be concerned that the industrial base of uh, my uh, salary was being undermined. But this only becomes democratically problematic if you believe the public are a passive bunch of paste eaters and they just consume what they're given. But that's simply not true, argues Peter Chen, especially of the kind of people who seek out politicians' blogs and Twitter feeds. Labour Senator for the ACT and Minister for Sport Kate Lundy was the first federal politician to set up her own website back in 1996. Now she has an active blog and 15,000 Twitter followers. In her view, what she does is essential because the press gallery is failing in its primary function, scrutinising and reporting government policy. People aren't getting news anymore about programs. We're not getting asked questions by the media about what we're actually doing. Um, it's all the, the sort of commentary about how we're doing our job or, or polls or leadership and, and issues that people... Uh, are sometimes interested in, but they don't want a steady diet of it. They actually want some facts in there somewhere about policy and programs. That frustration, says Kate Lundy, was perfectly exemplified at a press conference held by Minister for Health Tanya Plibersek to announce new funding for medical research at Westmead Hospital. No questions at all about clinical trials or the investment in patient care that we're doing here today, research and jobs of the future? Seems to go this morning. Nope. OK, polls then. Tanya Plibersek accepted that the media that day in February only wanted to ask about polls and the leadership. But Labour MP for Parramatta, Julie Owens, did not. You know, I mean, honestly, this, is, this affects people's lives, what we're talking about today. Do you honestly think the people out there that are going to watch your bulletins tonight care more about me than they do about the health of their children? And you're going to ask about me instead of their children? You know, get real. For the most part, the media entirely ignored Julie Owens's outburst. But when she posted that video on YouTube, it attracted thousands of views. I think it demonstrates with the way that went, you know, at least partially viral, it shows that there is a, um, a shared frustration amongst the voting public who are hungry for just facts about programs, policy information, uh, actual news about new announcements and so forth. There are those, of course, who believe that most of the media, and most politicians too, are peddling lies or are captured by vested interests. It's to people like that that maverick politicians can appeal directly far more easily than they've been able to do in the past. From his North Queensland stronghold, the leader of Qatar's Australian party conducts his own question time on Twitter, and on YouTube you can find every edition of Qatar Chatter, like this one about foreign fly-in workers. They will smash the award system. We will be getting paid nothing for our work uh, as we see foreigners take our jobs and don't think this will be confined to the iron ore mines or the coal fields. And Liberal Senator Cory Bernardi, 
forced to resign from the coalition front bench after linking gay marriage to bestiality, has attracted a significant online following using blogs, opinion sites, weekly emails, and a YouTube channel he calls CBTV. He is the leader of a spearhead movement to shift the Liberal Party into much more conservative territory. I think that's quite clear. And he's been very successful in drawing uh, parts of the Liberal Party towards that spectrum using these techniques. Just one day after the Boston Marathon bombings, Senator Bernardi was applying common sense to the event. The Chief of the Emergency Services at Massachusetts General Hospital said, this is the sort of carnage you expect to see in war. Well, that would be because we are at war. We're at war with terror and those who hate freedom and want to see the dismantling of Western values. Such foresight. At that stage, law enforcement agencies in Boston were still saying that they had no idea who was responsible for the bombing or why. Through digital media, politicians like Corey Bernardi can wield significant influence. But there's nothing secret about what they're doing. If mainstream journalists want to fact-check Corey Bernardi, says Peter Chen, there's nothing stopping them. I'm a member of Corey Bernardi's mailing list. I can write an article on what Corey says about any particular thing, as probably can you. The question is, are there going to be the number of journalists who have the time and the inclination to surveil a much broader communication landscape? The answer is probably not. And even as their numbers dwindle, more and more senior journalists appear to be spending time analysing and opining rather than digging and reporting. The TV chat shows and the news websites too are full of them. So when Charles Feldman throws down this challenge to politicians... What they should do is govern, stick to the job of governing, and leave journalism to people who do journalism. The politicians have a ready-made response. I would say the same thing back. Um, let journalists stick to their job, but let the, the politicians be the ones to be asked the questions about the motivation behind our, our policies, um, the implementation of our programs and what we're trying to achieve, rather than this quite circular phenomenon that we see all the time now of journalists talking to other journalists about these questions. That's one view Laurie Oakes shares. The journalist's job, he's always believed, is to ask the questions, not to answer them. Concentration on providing facts, simple unfiltered information, will be a real point of difference in the coming contest with the new kind of political journalists. The ones who will be players in the political game, reporting on themselves and using the media access that technology has given them to push their own political interests. Laurie Oakes is hoping, vainly perhaps, that the mainstream media will see that fact-based reporting, not endless opining, is what it can do better than the blogosphere. But he and I both fear that it may be too late. For much fuller versions of our interviews, visit our website from later tonight. Next week, back to our normal format. Until then, good night.